Thank you, Ross. Um, so it's really an honor for me to be doing this interview with Ken because he is one of my uh, heroes, my role models. When I started out covering um, media and communications. All Italians say this. Yeah. <laughs> no, truly, um, you know, we cover similar subjects, but he covers it the way I would like to. More importantly, he writes the way I would like to. And I think the secret to his sauce um, is that he's just a gifted writer and understands human beings. So we're talking a lot about technology here today. And a lot of your work, starting with, I believe, really, the Barry Diller piece you did early on in the New York, but even before that, you talk a lot about technology disrupting our world, but you're really talking about people. And to me, especially in his new book, which will be out shortly, there's a review copy, um, you crack the code on people I've been trying to understand for a long time. Now, I won't give away the store here, but is that really your secret, that the, as much as there's technology disruption going on, it's really about how it's impacting the humans and what those humans are doing with these technologies, basically? Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, there's no substitute if you're doing a book or a, a long piece in The New Yorker. Uh, for interviewing human beings, and um, and whether that human being is Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Martin Sorrell, and and I often begin on the assumption that I'm going to interview someone multiple times. I usually begin my first interview by doing a biography interview, and um, some people think that may be manipulative. If I'm asking someone, you know, where'd you grow up? Tell me about your mother and your father and your spouse and your et cetera, et cetera. But I often find that that's the most valuable interview I do because you make connections. For instance, Martin Sorrell talking about his father and, and how his father uh, was always a manager, even though he was brilliant and could have been a great entrepreneur, but he never got a chance and he felt pushed down. And Martin Sorrell had this chip on his shoulder all through his life that he got from the experience of his father. And he had it when he worked for Saatchi and Saatchi. And he was called the third brother, but he was not a major player. So if you, in helping to understand Martin Sorrell and what drove him at WPP in over 33 years, that biography interview was, was very valuable. Now, when it comes to the world you're in, uh, machine learning and AI, uh, you could argue, well, you know, it become, human beings become less important. But is that really true? I mean, I keep on thinking of, of Mark Zuckerberg in the fall of 2016, when he was basically said, you know, bots are being used and, and the Russians are hacking in and, and putting out fake news to Facebook sites. And, he's, and he said, quote, that's a crazy idea. Basically, he was saying, my machines would not allow that. Well, the machines did allow that. and so. Always, I think you're you're coming back to limitations of both people, but also of machines. I have an entire chapter in the book, my chapter 16, which is called "From Mad Men to Math Men," um, and it and it obviously tries to graph what's happening in the world of advertising as machines become more and more important. But ultimately, uh, you're going to have to rely on people, not just machines. So you're really a psychoanalyst. You, you, if you get to know someone and you spent a lot of time with them, and let's say Martin Sorrell, I probably, or Erwin Gottlieb, maybe I interview them 15 times uh, for a book like this. You, you know, you're asking them questions. You, it becomes very intimate, like a, a psych psychologist. But, um, but I'm not hazarding a guess as to their mental health. So let's draw the connection. The book is not about AI per se, but there's a lot of discussion of the role of algorithms, mad men to math men. Erwin Gottlieb in particular, he's been on this journey since he started out in media. I think he built like the first computer on Madison Avenue. Um, what did you learn from talking to them about this progression and where you think we're gonna end up in the not too distant future? It's right that you, Joe, that you single out Gottlieb. He really is a, uh, a brilliant guy and, and he's a believer in data, big data. And, and, and machines and, and AI. And he believes that, that in a world we're moving fast towards, 
where people reject ads, particularly on their mobile phones, which feel more and more like an interruption, that you need the data to be able to provide, to target ads at individuals and give them something useful. Um, and and he's, they spent a lot of money um, creating what they call their secret sauce, which is a, a collection of data about individuals. He says they have data on 200 million adult Americans um, to try and target those ads. But, but he can't target them without machine learning and, and AI. So it's, it's been part of a progression. Um, so what I really like about this book, and again, uh, I promise not to give away any uh, insights because it's not been released yet, but um, you do have some very colorful anecdotes about this period of time we're in. You described it as frenemies, and to me, it, is it okay if I talk about oh, sure. the subject sure. of the opening chapter? It starts off with John Mandel blowing the whistle on the media buying, hmm, maybe corruption's too big a word, but certainly, um, questionable practices. Joe and has a piece I was just reading, actually, on Media Post that you posted <laughs> yesterday, I guess. Yeah, about the videology bankruptcy filing, which uh, discloses that their biggest creditor is Group M, WPP's media agency, uh, $35 million, and we're trying to figure out why they would pay a media agency for that, but that's another interview. Um, but uh, my sense is that over time, as technology's progressed, and we're now going to a new one with AI and blockchain and other things, Trust is becoming a bigger issue. I mean, in the old days, this was a gentleman's business. It was handshake agreements. We're in upfront week right now where they used to literally trade billions of dollars with a handshake. You documented that in Three Blind Mice very well. But my feeling is, as technology takes on a bigger and bigger role, people feel very queasy and uneasy about doing business together. The, the reason that um, I call the book Frenemies um, uh, really gets to the trust issue, I think. Um, if you're an agency, uh, suddenly you are surrounded by people who used to be your allies, friends, business partners, consulting companies who were your accountants, um, Deloitte, you know, et cetera, are now aggressively getting into the advertising business, so they're your friend to me. Google and Facebook, which are, you put a lot of money, advertising dollars in, but increasingly they're disintermediating the agency world. PR agencies, which are becoming advertising agencies as newspapers shrink and the ability of them to sell through traditional PR, uh, they figure out new business and one of them is, is advertising. Look at the, the publishing companies. Usually your platform for placing your ads, you go to New York Times, they have 300 people on their sales force. 100 of them are creating ads. Vice, the largest part of their revenue comes from an ad agency they have in-house. So increasingly that's, I mean, then you look at, at clients. What are they doing? They're taking more and more stuff in-house to do themselves. But the larger frenemy, that's the frenemy for the ad agency business that breaks down the, the level of trust because you've got to be wary. Is, is, is this my partner or is this my competitor? But the biggest frenemy is the public because the public increasingly is saying, hey, we don't want to be interrupted on our mobile phones. We have, we have Netflix and HBO where we have no ads and we like that and we can watch when, what we want, when we watch, and as much as we want. And then you look at PVRs. Um, PVRs are, uh, according to Nielsen, 55% of everyone who, who records a program on their PVR skips the ads. So you look at that and you say, oh my God, and I haven't even mentioned ad blockers. 20% of Americans have ad blockers. One third of Western Europeans have ad blockers. So you say, oh my God, the real friend of me may be your customer. Well, that's not a very pretty picture. So are you optimistic about the future of this business? You've been covering it a long time. It's a pretty big indictment in some cases here of the disconnects between these stakeholders. Are you optimistic coming out of this or pessimistic? Um, I, I'm always optimistic, um, sometimes uh, forcing myself to be. Uh, intellectually, I could easily be a pessimist, um, but emotionally, I, I, don't, I, I, I wanna be an optimist. I, I, the larger point, uh, one of the truths I came to in reporting this book over the last three years, 
was that advertising was absolutely essential. Uh, the notion that, that, for instance, that subscriptions will replace advertising is crazy. The one thing that, that, that Trump and Hillary Clinton agreed on in the 2016 campaign is that the American pocketbook is stretched. That, that working class and middle class people, their income has not grown over the last decade. So how are they going to be able to afford to pay for what we now get for free because of advertising? But advertising has to change. But it's absolutely essential. Without it, newspapers die, and they're dying anyway, many of them. And without it, magazines die, and without it, TV dies. And a lot of things we get for free, like Facebook, 97% of Facebook's revenues come from advertising. Almost 90% of Google's come from advertising. Advertising is absolutely essential. So on that, I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm a believer. Uh, but you got to do something about your shitty ads. <laughs> well, clearly AI will improve that, right? Um, so let's get, you kind of alluded to it earlier that uh, humans are still a very important part of this equation. But we saw some really weird unintended consequences in the past year, particularly at Facebook, which you profile well in this book. Um, their use of machine learning algorithms to create new targeting mechanisms, they actually evolved on their own to target things like Jew haters. Now, nobody at Facebook willfully created that segment, but the machines did. Now they've gone back in and created protocols to stop that, but is that kind of the world we're going into next? And you know, they are hiring thousands of human curators now to moderate that. Which, but which they resisted for many years, thinking that machines could do the job, and they learned the limitations of machines. But <clears throat> I think the, the ignored issue here that, that the world of the engineering world and the data scientist world um, overlooked for too long, and it's coming back to bite them in a very serious way, is the privacy issue. If you're an engineer, and I, 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 I encountered this when I did a, in 2009, I published a book called Googled, uh, where I spent time embedded on the Google campus and trying to figure out what their secret sauce was and stuff. If you're an engineer or a data scientist, you love data. Data yields all these secrets. It, 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 it ends the mysteries that people have, why people do things. And that's a wonderful thing if you have. And, and if I have access to that data, the engineer says, look what I could do. And, 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 and I can create all these new products and these new platforms and these new ways of, of doing business or targeting ads, for instance. But they don't think about privacy. And increasingly, what happened in, in part because of the, the, the Google not the Google, but the, the Facebook uh, of 2016, Google and, and, and putting stuff on the wrong sites doesn't raise so much the privacy issue. It raises the reliability machine issue uh, and whether I want my friendly ads in, that, in your unfriendly environment. But the privacy issue is huge. And you look at what's happening on May 25th in the European Union. 25, 28 nations have, have basically passed legislation that says if you <clears throat> that people have to opt in in order to get ads. Everyone in the advertising community opposes opt in. They want people to opt out, but opt out is very hard to do, as we all know. And and but if people have to opt in, they're going to miss and not see a lot of ads. So that terrifies them. But the reason for that is because of worries about privacy, which are much more intense in Europe than they are in the United States, but they're growing here as well. And you saw that when the Congress summoned Mark Zuckerberg to testify, even though many of the questions were semi-literate. But the, the animus behind it, the drive behind it, was a real concern about privacy and protecting the American public. So that I, I see that and the dangers of regulation for these digital giants growing. So there's a real tension here, which is that, you know, marketers and platforms and media companies want to provide more seamless, frictionless experiences for consumers. If I had to tell my Google Navigate app that I was me every time I needed to get from point A to point B, it'd be a hardship. I probably wouldn't use it as much and I'd probably get lost. Um, but we're in this period now where you have uh, two worlds colliding on privacy. What do you think the net outcome will be between GDPR, right to be forgotten, e-privacy, and what's going on here in the United States? Uh, my suspicion is that uh, 
whether through government regulation or government pressure, and maybe some public pressure, that the digital companies will be compelled to make some moves to regulate, to, to, to convey their concern about privacy and to offer some protection. They will not want to do what legislation, what people propose in legislation, and I don't know whether they will pass the legislation, but it's very interesting to note that there isn't a lot of difference between Republicans and Democrats on this issue of privacy. Uh, it used to be the Democrats were very pro Silicon Valley companies in the Obama administration being a classic example of that. The, and the Republicans were more worried, but the Republicans loved the fact that they could, uh, that Facebook would come and teach them how to use it and use it in their campaign. So th there was a, a kind of bipartisan support for this great, for the innovators out west who were doing these wonderful things. There's that, uh, that bloom is off that rose. And, and where it leads, I don't know, Joe. I don't know what the answer is, but I know it is, these people are scared and they should be. Yeah, and I know you're not a forecaster, you're a journalist chronicling changes, but you've been doing it for a couple of decades now and there's a pattern here. And the biggest pattern is that technology keeps getting more powerful, faster, bigger, more data, and humans are losing more and more control over it. Um, you must have some gut now. Um, I mean, I kind of have a dystopian view myself at this point. Um, I just think we're at this precious little inflection point where quite possibly an AI program could do a better job, not writing as well as you do, but certainly writing as well as I do. And I, I could be out of a job soon. I actually don't believe that, Joe. I, I mean, I think that that a reporter like you, for instance, um, you're going out and you're talking to people. And there's no, I, I mean, even you think about it as a journalist, if you give me a choice between doing an interview on the phone or an interview in person, I want to do that interview in person. Because people want to connect to a human being, particularly if the human being is, is a reasonable listener, doesn't talk too much, doesn't ask a long-winded question, doesn't insist on talking about their exploits and their biography and all that. So there's no substitute for that reporter. No machine is gonna substitute for that, sorry. Uh, I mean, look, think about your experience talking to Alexa. Uh, you know, it's not as satisfying. Hear that, Google? Um, so, all right, this is a small, intimate group here, and we are streaming to the world. Um, if you don't mind, can I ask, who was your favorite interview subject of all time? What did you learn the most from interviewing that person? Oh, that, that's a good question. Um, I can tell you who my worst was. Let me start by that, and hopefully I'll I was of, getting to one. Yeah. The, the, worst, the, the worst human being I ever met, uh, I don't know whether you, you know of him, but Roy Cohn. Oh, I was going to say. And Roy Cohn is actually the person Donald Trump calls his mentor. And in, in, I'm dating myself, but in 1978, I did a cover story profile of Roy Cohn in Esquire magazine. Interviewed Trump at the time. And, and what he loved about Roy Cohn is Roy Cohn was the guy, he was the counsel of the Army McCarthy hearings, and he was Joe McCarthy's counsel. And he was a killer. I mean, and, and Roy Cohn was a guy who loved to say, you know, I'm in the business of killing people. In fact, my piece was called The Legal Executioner. And I thought he would hate it. He loved it because that was a way of, of advertising to clients, if you want to kill your spouse, if you want to kill your ex-business partner, hire me and I'll do it for you. But what he did and Trump loved was that Roy Cohn believed you never apologize, you always attack, hyperbole is good, meaning lies are good, um, you never settle lawsuits, you attack, 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 and you, and whatever you say, it doesn't matter. Just say it and be aggressive. And that's what Donald Trump did, and, and he felt protected by Roy Cohn. And if you watch Co Trump today, he follows out a lot of what Roy Cohn does. Roy Cohn was just this killer, and, and just a really unpleasant guy. Who were the most attractive people? I'll tell you someone, um, there's, there was a guy, a New York Times reporter by the name of McClandish Phillips. And McClandish Phillips was a reporter for the Times and arguably the best writer on the paper. 
And he did a piece in Queens. He went out to Queens and did an interview with a guy at a diner who was the head of the American Nazi Party. And across the table in the diner, he says to this not American Nazi, you're Jewish. And the guy's eyes lit up. What do you mean I'm Jewish? He said, your real name is, and he had all the data on him. And he looked down, and, and the Nazi took a knife, you know, and just held it at the table. And McClandish Phillips, who was about six foot four, but thin as a rail, was kind of terrified that he was going to stab him. He didn't. He cried, you're going to destroy my life. He then had to make a decision. Do I run this story in the Times? And of course, he did run the story in the Times. The Times ran on page one. The head of the American Nazi Party committed suicide. Mm. McClandish Phillips decides to leave reporting and follow the Lord. And if you went up to Columbia, as I did to find him some years later, he was a preacher on the streets, giving out literature, talking about. And I spent a couple of weeks with him, wrote a profile of him, and of this experience, but also what he was doing. He was actually one of the most inspired human beings I've ever met, um, and a real believer. And, and um, he died about two years ago, but, but he was, um, I'm, I was impressed by him. Well, that's quite a spectrum between Roy Cohen and him. By the way, you can read the Roy Cohen piece on Kenna Letter's website, and there's a wonderful podcast updating his point of view on that. I kind of feel like it's Roy Cohen's sweet revenge that Donald Trump is president, but. but I, I tell you one story about Roy Cohen. He, um, Roy Cohen was gay, he died of AIDS, but he never would admit it, uh, that he was gay. And I, I would follow him and I knew he would hang out at a place called Uncle Charlie's South on 2nd Avenue and 39th Street, I think it was. And it's where young boys went. And he would pick them up and, and stuff. So my editor of es the editor of Esquire was, was someone Ken Fadden knows really well, Clay Felker. And Felker would say to me, he was this legendary editor, he would say, you're going to put in the piece that Roy Cohn is gay? I said, no. And so then, but I couldn't resist my last interview with Cohn at his brownstone on in the upper 60s, East 60s. He comes down in a, in a pink terry cloth robe and he sits down. He was very effete, um, particularly in, in a private setting. And I said, Mr. Cohn, are you gay? With the tape recorder running. He said, and, and for the first time, Roy Cohn was someone who always had black and white answers to everything, yes or no. For the first time, he kind of had, she said, well, I know there's city council legislation about gay rights, and it's a really complicated issue, and well, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. I said, Mr. Cohn, are you gay? And he wouldn't answer, and he kind of fumfered. And I left the interview. The, I come back, I write the piece. Clay Felco looks, he says, there's nothing here about him being gay. And I said, no, and there won't be. I said, I only did, I, I asked him, but I wouldn't publish it because if you, if, you, if you ask the question, are you gay, you're really doing what he did to people in the Army of McCarthy hearings. Are you now or have you ever been a communist? The asking of a question would assume there's something wrong with you. And the asking of the gay question would be assuming that something's wrong with being gay. I just wanted to punish the son of a bitch and, and succeed in doing. And so that, that was my reason. Another reason you're my hero. Um, Okay, um, we promised Ken we'd get him off a little early because we started a little later than we expected today, but um, we have some time for questions if anybody would like to talk to the world's consummate journalists on communications, media, technology. Yeah, back we got there. a question right here in the back. Just tell us who you are, where you work. Sure, uh, Rob Sesson from the uh, Museum of Modern Art. Uh, I want to talk about privacy just a little bit more and the changing way that generations are looking at privacy. And are you seeing like a difference in say how 18 year olds see privacy nowadays who have like grown up with this technology versus like 40 year olds? Yeah, I, I actually write about this some in, in, in this book, uh, new book. Um, when I interviewed Evan Spiegel um, back in 2015 for this book, Spiegel, the founder of Snapchat said to me that, that he believed that his Generation Z, the younger, folks than the millennials um, 
they had a, a fierce concern about privacy. And that's why I don't collect the data on them that Facebook does. And so he saw the privacy issue as a cutting edge business issue against Facebook. If you follow Snapchat and the difficulties they've had, they've totally switched. I mean, they now do collect the data and the privacy issue is on the back burner. The, the argument that, that the Facebook folks have made for years is that the millennials care less about privacy, they wanna share. And that in fact is Zuckerberg's philosophy going in, that privacy matters less, it's the world sharing, everything is exposed and open. I think they've been forced to change that um, uh, philosophy, but th there is some evidence that the Generation Z cares more about privacy uh, than say millennials do. And both uh, probably care more about privacy than, than, than some others do. Question here. Hi, my name is Mike Zara. I'm with the Content Marketing Partners. Uh, staying with the privacy uh, thread, I have access to a large community of 20, mid 20s because I am the father of triplets that are that, that, that age, right? What I see is at that age, they are, they share, but they're very aggressively managing their privacy. They're savvy and they aggressively manage who gets to see what. Now, so that's just a comment. The, the question is, haven't the big companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, haven't they all just put a stake in the ground that they're treating the GDPR regulation compliance as a global compliance? That they're, in other words, I got emails in the last two weeks from all four of those companies saying, we just changed our privacy, you know, uh, Paige, please go read it. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily adhere to the European standards. I mean, they have their own protocols. But they hate the European standard. Yeah. Uh, the, the, a problem for a global company is how do you, how do you create a global uh, system uh, when Western, 28 countries in Western Europe have a system that's not, not consistent, say, with the US and some other countries in the world. So they're, they're compelled to do something on that. Um, but, but they want to resist that as much as they can. You know, one of the, one of the I have a piece actually in the New Yorker coming out next week uh, where I, I talk about this um, for, for the book. The, the one thing that unites math men and madmen is the belief in data and the belief, the importance of data. Um, and they, they it, you, you don't go to a marketing meeting, and I sat in many, while reporting this book, where, where people don't wail about how come the wall gardens of Facebook and Google don't share more data with us. We need more data. We gotta be able to target ads at, at people. We need ROI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so they all want more data and they're united in that. And yet the governments are coming at them with greater raising barriers on, on data and how they deal with that in the next several years is, I don't know the answer to that, but I know it's a big, big issue. And it creates enormous anxiety in, in Silicon Valley, which is good. Yeah, I think your observation about Snapchat is pretty keen. I also think if you look at new data that's come out on the digital platform's usage and time spent, uh, you'll see that in uh, February and March, Facebook actually flattened out and declined. Keep an eye on that one. And lastly, I just want to ask the audience, um, who has a millennial child in this room or knows of one? Raise your hand. Um, how keep your hand up if they own a phone. Keep your hand up if they've actually set up their um, messaging for their inbox on their voicemail. OK, <laughs> pretty good. Anyway, I want to thank Ken um, for taking time out on a busy day this week in New York. Um, thank you for doing this. Thank and you, I really encourage you to, to read it when it comes out in June. Thank you. Friend of me.